If you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26 this morning, our text will be verses 26 through 30. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 30. Before we read, let us go to our God in prayer and ask for his 
wisdom and guidance. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can return once again to this word, your, your word that has been given to us, to feed us, to nourish us, to give us strength. Lord, we pray that this morning we would make good and faithful application so that you might be glorified and your people edified. We ask this now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it, and we say, Amen. Okay, so we will talk first about uh, one of our favorite subjects. Food. Amen. The first thing I want to state, uh, when a person eats food, that food goes into him and becomes a part of his body, his living body. It literally becomes incorporated into a system and is utilized as a means of staying alive. It's nourishing. And throughout the Bible, uh, things like milk and honey, bread and wine, uh, they all become symbols, pictures of God's provision for his people. Um, not only literally do they feed his people, but they serve as uh, pictures of spiritual nourishment. Foods we have such as bread and wine, milk and honey, these things that are basic to life, that God himself is the one who gives it because we need it. We need it to live. We need real food, actual physical food to live. Food, also, we'll note, um, it uh, tastes... Good. Depending on who cooks it, I guess. It's a gift. This is one of the gifts of eating, right? That uh, food is not something that just goes in and does what it needs to do to provide uh, that uh, physical nourishment, but uh, God ordained that it would actually be an enjoyable experience. Yesterday, uh, had the opportunity to look at something like what we might otherwise refer to as an ocean bottom crawler, like a lobster. Uh, thankfully now all foods are clean. And this critter, this sea crawling creature, um, once it's set in this cauldron of boiling seawater, it's taken out, you crack the shell, and uh, you, you get to that meat, right? And uh, once you get the meat, the meat tastes great, right? But you gotta do something else that'll make it even taste better. You take that, you make sure every bit of lobster flesh is just drowning in butter. And then you proceed to insert. <laughs> oh. And it's a high point of main life and prosperity, is it not? So it tastes really good. It didn't have to taste good, but God made it this way. He gave all these gifts to us. So food, of course, it's a necessity. Food also, it's something that tastes good. Another thing to note, note that food is, we might say, uh, communal. It's something that we often eat with others. Um, 
There's something special about sitting down together. Each person that's around a meal or a table um, communicating with one another while taking a portion of that dish that's served, each taking from this one dish and then participating, enjoying it, eating, and sharing in that experience. Food, food it's a necessity, it tastes good, and it's something that we do communally. Uh, food, something else that I should note, is not in entitlement. But a but a gift. In our generation, uh, we've grown up with plenty, every one of us. We've all had plenty. Uh, we often take for granted the ma mass amounts of food that our nation has. Uh, this, again, if we're thinking by faith, thinking rightly, is a consequence. It's the result of a nation that has been built upon Christian truths and principles. We're a blessed nation to be able to experience uh, freedom so that we might use the creative gifts that God has given to own property, to grow, to sell, um, to uh, artistically create dishes, businesses, and, and to enjoy this abundance of food that's all around us. Um, we are still reaping the benefits, again, of this nation being built on these Christian principles that has, that, that, uh, that has allowed for this kind of Blessing. But again, now what do we see culturally as we look around? We no longer see our culture giving thanks to God. In our nation, nation as it's becoming more and more apostate, uh, we see many freedoms being rejected, um, being uh, uh, taken away, um, freedoms that God gives. But right now we still have an abundance of food. So, again, we don't, as a people... I think we could speak here corporately. We're not uh, familiar what, with what it's really like to be for lack, uh, or to, to lack in this department of eating. It wasn't that long ago that um, this wasn't the case. And even in the world, we've seen that relative poverty has been relieved over time by God's common grace and by God's grace that has been given to nations that are more Christian. But remember communism, the Soviet Union, God hating atheistic system that promised prosperity and food and blessing and equality when really what happened was the only ones who had plenty were the corrupt rulers that were in charge. It's like George Orwell's book in Animal Farm where he says all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Uh, my paternal grandmother told us a story once where uh, she was re remembering a fellow family member that she had who experienced suffering and starvation as a result of what was called the Holodomor. Holodomor. That is a Ukrainian word where Holod means death or extermination or um, Extermination by, that's what this phrase means, extermination by hunger. Hunger, halod, and more extermination. So this is what it came to be known as. She remembered that uh, one of the family members, when she was little, she saw had these very swollen legs uh, because of a lack of food, starvation. And uh, she also mentioned that that was a time where they had to eat horse meat. That's all they had. Um, I was listening to this book this past week called The Red Famine, Stalin's War in Ukraine, and the author, Anne Applebaum, she says, at least five million people died from starvation in the Soviet Union during the years 1931 to 1934, including 3.9 million Ukrainians. She said the Soviet Union's disastrous decision to force peasants to give up their land and join collective farms, the eviction of the kulaks, the wealthier peasants from their homes, the chaos that followed, these policies were all ultimately the responsibility of Joseph Stalin, the general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party. Collectivization of the farmlands of Ukraine okay, began in 1929. 
the state acting like a tyrant, promising that uh, food would be more abundant if they distributed it equally. This did not happen. But Stalin wanted the country with its hugely fertile black soil, what was really going on, to be the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. He wanted to feed the important party officials and to export its grain abroad to fund its vast industrialization projects. It was an unmitigated disaster. Farmers were no longer paid for their produce, but worked according to a ration system based on their productivity. In reality, it made them beholden to the party, which controlling their finances was able to control all aspects of their lives. They were no longer able to buy food. So, as I'm hearing this, you know, these connections are made, and we recall some of these stories, but this is something like my, um, my paternal grandmother had experienced. My maternal grandmother, on the other hand, when she was taken by um, the Germans, she went through a period of having to work as a laborer, but on her transition, she wasn't fed for multiple days. They were being transported like cattle in trains, and after not eating for a couple of days, she told a story where she remembered everyone jumping out and eating the grass. They were so hungry. They had anything that they could get into their body without drink or without water. So I only bring those stories up to just help you to remind you that not everyone everywhere has grown up with such great prosperity that you've enjoyed. Many people have gone through very, very hard times of not being able to eat food, not having access to it. <clears throat> and there have been corrupt regimes that have come into a, to power that have intentionally used things like starvation to quiet, to try to put a stop to a particular people who sought independence as a nation. Um, these things happen, and it's not that far, it's not that long ago that these kinds of events were taking place in our world. So food for us, it's often, it's easy to be presumptuous. They think, oh, it's always gonna be there, it's always here. But we should remember that it's not always been the case, but God has been gracious to us as a people. So food, it's not an entitlement, but it really is a gift and a result of God's Blessing. But I will also say this, food is not enough. Food is not enough. Even being given physical food and having access to it, right, and growing up with it without a worry that you'll have it, isn't enough to be under God's blessing and to have peace. Yes, food is necessary physically, but there are times when food, it, it is in front of us, we do have it, or we have it in abundance, and that prosperity, um, the much that is before us, is not a blessing. It can become a curse. It can become a curse. You remember the law reading this morning? Yeah? What did Israel want to do? Did they have food? They did. God provided them with manna. So they had food. But they became discontent. Where did they want to go? Yeah, where do they want to go? They were discontent. They were upset. They had no meat. They had, what else did they miss as a part of their diet? Even though the God provided them with what they needed. I mean, <laughs> you can understand when you read this. You're like, I mean, I kind of get it. This sounds delicious. I mean, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic, all of these delicious foods. And all we have is this man. So they complained. He said it. But really, what were they saying? They preferred slavery and a handout rather than the freedom and responsibility that God had given them and was bringing them into. They, even though they had food, it wasn't enough. They became presumptuous. They became ingrates, ungrateful for what God had done. They stopped thanking God. The conclusion of that story 
We didn't get to it, but now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It brought them down all around the camp to about three feet above the ground, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night and the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Not Simpsons. Um, it says here that that was about 30 bushels. I'm sorry, 60 bushels. Um, then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hata Ava, uh, which means graves of craving, because there they buried the people who had craved other food. From Kibroth Hata Ava, the people traveled to Hezroth and stayed there. Food, is it necessary? Yes. Is it enough to be under God's blessing and to have peace? No, it's not. And we can see the story teaches us this. We must remember when we have much to not fall into this air, becoming discontent, ungrateful, prideful, forgetting the God who is the giver of life and of food. This temptation is not unique to Israel. Now, remember in Deuteronomy chapter 8, um, where God says through his servant Moses, very clearly he gives them uh, this command to not forget where they came from. Don't forget where you came from. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and you have all the, um, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord. The Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, the thirsty and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble you, to test you, so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power, my power. And the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed. For not obeying the Lord your God. In 1890, the theologian R. L. Dabney, he wrote with particular foresight um, an essay, and he titled it Our Secular Prosperity, where after he points out the enormous amount of material prosperity that was in the land at his time, economy was strong. Prosperity was at hand. Growth was occurring. He asked this question. Now we have pointed out these facts to lead the minds of ministers and private Christians to inquiry. Is this a spiritually safe state to be in? Has the church ever been able to stand such temporary prosperity without being poisoned by it? Let us get the answer to this question from history and from human nature. The past answers that there has not been a single instance in which the spiritual health of the church has survived a season of high temporal prosperity. She has survived the sword and the fire. Like the burning bush, persecutions have not consumed her. The power of kings and commonwealths and the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against her. But never in a single case has she failed to succumb before 
the miasm, that's the stain, of temporal ease and plenty. When under Joshua, God made Israel ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of the kine and milk of sheep, with that fat of lambs and rams, the breed of Bashan and goats, with the fat of kidneys of wheat. In other words, a lot of great stuff. <laughs> and he did drink pure blood of the grape. What was the result? Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Israel got fat and kicked, became discontent. Content, complain, they grumbled. Presumption, ingrates, that's what they became. And then he goes on to give a history of how this occurred even under David and Solomon and under Constantine. And even now, in areas where there were particular places after the Reformation that, was, that, that prospered, have since not been of the same state. Going down through history saying this is characteristic of our nature. We have a problem. We forget to thank God when we have much. We forget who it is that we depend on for our life. He says this about times where the church uh, is tried, it's going through difficulty. The spiritual life of a Christian or a church is like the roots of a sturdy oak, which grow more tough by the storm because then they grasp the more tightly uh, to the crevices of a rock. It is like refined gold, which must be purified from its dross in the furnace of fire. It is like the strength and hardy wood of the soldier, which are formed by exposure in battle. Let the Christian be persecuted, troubled, and afflicted, and his trial, by casting down his heart, brings it to the footstool of grace and humble prayer. And there he finds a strength which rises elastic, and indomitable under every oppression because it is the strength of divine omnipotence. It's often during those seasons of trial where we grow most because we recognize we need God, we need Him. And it's easy to become prideful and to lack humility when we have plenty. So, food is not enough, right? Okay, so let's just move things along. We know, as we read the scripture, that mankind has been enslaved to sin. So since the fall in the garden, man has been need, in need of deliverance. Man is dead in his sin. Man cannot shovel his way out of his own grave. Unsaved man suppresses the truth of God in unrighteousness, in thanks himself. He worships the creation rather than, rather than the creator who gave him everything. So he doesn't thank God. He's not interested in giving credit to where credit is due. But despite this reality, God sovereignly willed to come down and provide deliverance for a particular people to rescue them out of this bondage. History, right? History, anyone? We, we, let's, let's think now as we're, we're, we're considering the Bible. What historical event in the scripture do we have recorded that tells us about the birth of a nation? The people whom God would take as his own. What event would be the marker, you might say, of a new beginning? What great deliverance did God say must be celebrated and remembered for the rest of history so that God's people wouldn't forget their freedom and prosperity and where it came from? So they wouldn't forget how then they would inherit a land of milk and honey where they would have plenty of bread and the blood of the grape. What event became the identity marker, a renewal of their loyalty, the people's loyalty to their provider, the yearly marker for Israel to celebrate a festival unto the Lord wherein they would retell this story of great deliverance and how God showed the world that he alone is God and that there is no other. Delivering his people from the idols of this world. He delivered his people, a people who were caught up in the mechanisms of idolatry, of self-worship, of state tyranny. What, 
what, what festival am I, what, what are we talking about? Anyone know? To celebrate the deliverance of God's people out of slavery and bondage every year, God's people were to, there were three major festivals in the Old Testament, right? The first one, Passover. yes, it was Passover. A. A. Hodge said, when God delivered the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt, he sent forth his angel commission to destroy the firstborn in each Egyptian household. Remember, this is, let's do a little remembering here of this story, right? Um, he commanded the Israelites by families to select a male lamb of the first year without blemish and slay it at the setting of the sun, and then with a sprig of hyssop, sprinkle the lintels and the side posts of the doors of their houses. The blood was to them a token upon the houses where they were. For when the Lord saw the blood, he passed over them, so that the plague of death which destroyed the Egyptians did not come upon them. They were also commanded to roast the flesh of the lamb that night and to eat it entirely before the morning, with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and their loins girded, and their feet shod, and their staves in their hands. They were to eat in haste, ready to depart. So we learn that from Exodus chapter 12 and 13. And so God himself, God knows his people. He knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows that we need these kinds of events, big ones, to remember why it is that we can have freedom and be under his blessing. So he said, I want a memorial that you participated regularly, routinely within the year. So that you, as my people, would not forget this true source of freedom, prosperity, and blessing. And so in Israel, every year, this would be observed. This Exodus story, right, the Passover story, would be retold. So that generations would remember what God had done. And so when Jesus came into the world, he did so as the fulfillment of this great exodus and as the fulfillment of Passover. He came as the sacrifice for the sins of the world. He came as the servant king, the Lamb of God, who would be broken, his blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus, during the Passover meal, and here we are, we're finally almost there to our text, right? All this is giving us context as we go into the text, but during the Passover meal, that's when Jesus took bread and broke it and took the cup and he gave thanks. It was the custom during Passover for the head of the house or for that who was leading the Passover to during the meal tell the story and to interpret it and to explain its meaning and application to the people that was present with them. And that's what Jesus did. He took this meal. This meal, this commemoration, this great deliverance, memorial. And he said, the greater exodus has arrived. In fact, Hodge went on to note, the meaning and fruition of the entire line of prophets and of priests, of sacrificial offerings and periodical feasts depended on his coming up to this particular feast fulfilling the promise, giving reality to the symbolic representation of all that had gone before, all these sacrifices, all these lambs, all that blood poured was all pointing to him. Therefore, he at once fulfilled all the prophecy of the past and inaugurated the future of realized redemption. He ate with his disciples the flesh and blood of the typical Passover, and while doing so, he gave to the elements a new and higher significance, and thus developed out of the Paschal Supper of the past, the Lord's Supper of the incomparably more glorious future. So he took the bread, unleavened bread, which he had, which would have been custom to eat during this meal, and had been eaten for some 1,600 years. While he was eating, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and said to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. And in Luke's account, it says, do this in remembrance of me. 
It says, if he said, you, you, you won't need to kill the Paschal lamb anymore. All we need here is this bread. Where when it's broken, you'll remember that I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I am the true Passover sacrificed for you. My blood will ratify this promise, this covenant that I am making, this new covenant, where I will take upon myself sin. I will be pierced for my people's transgressions, crushed for their iniquities. And after my blood would be poured out, they would receive forgiveness and see the light of life. And my work will justify many and I will make intercession for them. Do this in remembrance of me. This bread and cup that Jesus here takes and fulfills, it becomes a life source for his disciples. Jesus said, don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember why it is that you have life. Remember to give thanks and feed on me. And likewise, he took the cup with all its associations that had come about over the years in celebration during the Passover meal. He glorified its meaning and gave it newness. And he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. He came into this world to provide a way out of bondage, to be set free so that we could be released from this bondage that really was behind all the trouble, which is sin itself. Jesus himself in John chapter 6 says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So in conclusion, our abundance, the prosperity that we see all around us has led us to be a nation of pride. Right? Pride month just ended. Do you think that's a symbol? of where we are as a nation. Culturally, that we tolerate this. And so, yes, we see that there's great need of repentance. And this is all happening in the context where we still have plenty of food. And you have all these people who are trying to celebrate unrighteous things, wicked things, and they're actually starved for the truth. The truth is what will set them free. It is Jesus Christ who came to set people free so that they might live in obedience to God, which is the place where all the blessing is at. Whether we have a lot or a little, we know the secret of contentment. And that is because we trust in our God, who is the true provider of all our needs. It is he who nourishes us. He who gives us the resources that we need. Pray to him. Be humble. Continue to go back to the throne of your Lord. Don't stop thanking God. Don't forget to remember. He is the Lord of the covenant, the King of kings, and he's preparing this world to be handed over to his Father. And he is currently subduing his enemies and setting his people free. In the process, as his people are loyal, serving him, the world is being saved and transformed. It's bearing fruits, food, fruit, genuine food. Not the kind that will not last. Don't forget to remember what God has done and is doing through Jesus. As we look forward to the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. Then we with him will drink the fruit of the vine anew, with him and the Father in heaven. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks that you are a faithful God. And in our sin, Lord, we ask that you would continue to 
bear with us as you have done so many times. And Lord, we pray that even in the midst of prosperity, that you would give us grateful hearts. Lord. We pray that the sin of pride would be crushed in each and every one of us, and that we would remember to be humble, to thank you, to love one another, to seek to provide one another's needs, Lord. Help us to be self-sacrificial as your son who came and was broken on our behalf has done himself, Father. Help us to imitate him in every way. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, who is our prophet, our priest, and our king. Amen.